This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. The brain function. She did her PhD in computational neuroscience with Gustavo Deco in Spain, followed by a postdoc at the psychiatry department in Oxford in the UK with Morten Kringelbeck. Sorry, I can't say his name. Uh, she returned to Portugal in 2017, where she maintains an extensive network of international collaborators. And she has published over 60 research articles covering a wide range of neuroimaging studies and modeling works, and has presented in over 40 international meetings. She was awarded the L'Oreal Award for Women in Science in 2018, and is currently funded by uh, Fondation La Caixa. So she's also from Portugal, like me, so I am very pleased that we can talk Portuguese afterwards. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm really pleased to, to have you here. It's uh, really a treat to have international speakers come to Melbourne who are here for a different reason and we can just grab them and say, hey, will you give us a talk? Because um, as we all know, Australia is quite far away and it's, it's hard to, to have uh, international, international speakers of this caliber. So thank you, Joanna, for talking to us today. Thank you, Marta, for the very kind introduction, and thank you also to you for being here today. Um, I will share with you some of the insights I've been finding, also questions that arise together with the findings, uh, trying to understand indeed what brain function is. So overall, the outline of my talk will be separated in two parts. One is more about this function, evidence of functionally relevant modes in brain activities, what do they mean? Uh, and then what would be the, the generative mechanism and this, this idea of resonance or resonant waves uh, really uh, thing that we can capture. So in terms of motivation, I like to put this big perspective. So on one side, when we want to understand brain function, we, I understand it as this nearly infinity of activity patterns that relate with cognition, emotion, behavior, but we don't really know what it is. But what we know is that when function is disrupted, it leads to cognitive impairment, to psychiatric disorders, syndromes, disorders of consciousness. So this is a real problem that we need to tackle. So it's not just about finding, defining the hard or the soft problem of consciousness, but it's really a problem that if we can help and find solutions, it can have a huge impact for humanity, right? And how do we tackle this? Well, we try to look at the brain as an organ, and I try to look at beyond only neurons as a system of neurons, but considering we have to have in mind that this has fluids and fields and astrocytes and ventricles in it. I won't go too much into that direction, but all these things will help us understand what are the, the fundamental principles, right? Mechanisms, what is called in engineering the constitutive equations, because only then we can really try to tackle this, this big problem. So first, let's take a look at brain activity and why I chose to, 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 to show this video is that we, we generally look at uh, fMRI signals from the perspective of, I don't know, co-activation patterns, functional connectivity, very abstract things, but we rarely really see what the signal is. And so here, are, this is pre-processed data I received from a collaborator, but from two different, two different subjects actually. And it looks super noisy, right? So these are different slices of the brain at the same time. And although it looks noisy, if we look carefully, we see some patterns of activity appearing. And I kind of highlighted here some points, just see. So here, for example, where we see that the signal here, you see here, this would be the posterior cingulate, the angular gyrus, and here the anterior cingulate, like there's a pole here that activates, and if you look at the different time points, you see almost a negative representation of this pattern, here would be the DMN, but there are others, but just to highlight these things, so you see here after some time, you see a similar pattern appearing, and after some time, another, but again the negative of it, and if you look at other subjects, for example, this one, just to highlight a bit, there are some patterns that despite the noisiness and the, the chaos, so we feel like, no, this is not just noise, this is structured noise. And so how do we 
kind of try to understand what is going on. So if we take all these fMRI volumes, you know, so the, the signals that we detect are volumes at each time point over time, and the idea is can we detect this, these patterns over time, also taking into account this negative representation, and using this algorithm I, I developed called LIDA, it's, I won't go specifically into the technicalities of the algorithm, but what it captures is that it's, so both of these patterns, either the negative or positive representation are considered the same, and we just cluster all the patterns that we detect across time, and we average across all the scans that we have, and then we can even project it back into the, the MNI space and see how this pattern looks like in space. So this here you recognize it's the, what is called the default mode network. Mm -hmm. But what is it? And is this, this relevant? So more and more people are finding that these uh, uh, modes slash networks, because indeed it depends on how you represent it, but they seem to have a function. And in psychiatry, for example, more and more, this is a work by Leanne Williams, where they are proposing that indeed this these patterns of activity or these networks, they have a functional relevance and they can be associated with specific things like attention, positive effect, negative effect, cognitive control, salience. So that's why it relates either to emotion, to cognition. Uh, but the thing is that, so they are consistently detected in human fMRI studies, and this is not just, I mean, there have been, as you know, uh, many initiatives trying to collect data like big data and different centers. I've applied it to, the, I don't know, maybe 30 different data sets and we consistently detect these patterns. They are detected across mammals and now it has been quietly uh, robust uh, that the modes we detect in rat brain activity are analogous to what we see in the, in the human brain. They appear to be disrupted in disease or psychiatric syndromes, so there's something there. And they can be modulated by drugs, tasks, uh, also transcranial electric stimulation, also natural stimuli like music. So there's something in them, even if they appear spontaneously, that relates to some function. So one way to, 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 to study their function and to try to see if they really uh, change significantly across conditions is that with this algorithm of detection over time, so we can it's a dynamic functional connectivity, but I like more to see it. So if this would be the fMRI signals over the entire scan, we can see which are the time points during which this mode was dominant, right? This mode appeared stronger. And we can then, for each single scan, having these uh, different modes, uh, it depends, you can choose 5, 10, or whatever, but you can count how often, so what was the relative probability, which is also called the fractional occupancy of a, a given state, during a scan. So you can say, okay, this, this scan there was 20% of the MN. And then you can use this single scan matrix to compare across conditions, right, to run statistics. So here is more the formalism of these, uh, these measures, what is the occupancy, we can really use the theory of dynamical systems to uh, uh, quantify this uh, uh, probability of occurrence of these networks in a very formalized way, mathematical way. We can count also the dwell time, which is once a pattern is activated, how long you remain in there. Is there some functional relevance on remaining there? So in the first study where I applied this algorithm was in a data set that we had like healthy elders, so they were more than 60 years old. And they um, were categorized, so there was a sample of 4,000 people. They were all interviewed, they were all healthy, and then they selected from the best cognitive performers and the worst cognitive performers, like 50 of each, to come to the scanner. And there was some motion and things, but in the end the data set had 88 healthy adults, 44 good performers, 44 poor performers. And I applied this, and at the time we found there was a significant difference in the occurrence of a, a mode. So the first mode there is the global mode, which means everything is in phase. Here the representation is slightly different from the other. It was a, a first, uh, it wasn't so beautiful as it is becoming now. But the idea is that there is a mode where everything activates in phase, and another mode where some subcortical structures are in antiphase with the rest. But we find significant difference. So good performers had more of this global mode. 
and less of uh, visual and the somatomotor mode. Then at the time, well, the statistics were showing something, but it needed more, you know, development on this to see. So we applied these two different uh, data sets. And one thing that we decided to look at was, uh, is there something in the transition probabilities? Like when you're in a given state, what's the probability to switch to another state? Can we um, learn something by looking at this? Uh, it's called a Markov chain uh, uh, transition. Uh, and uh, so imagine you have one state, which is the global here, number one. So once people are in this state, with higher probability, they will remain in that state in the next time point. So that's the transition probability matrix. So when you're in state one, in the diagonal, you see how long you remain in that state. That's the probability. Then once you're there, you may switch to any of the other modes, like to the default mode network, or to the somatomotor, or to the visual, with a certain probability, and then decay back to the global state. So this first column, so it shows that there's always higher probability of returning back to state one. So from the perspective of dynamical systems theory, this suggests that this global mode of activity, like in synchronized activity, is kind of a main attractor, but then you have this ghost attractors where the dynamics switches to, and it's quite consistent across healthy subjects. So we read a lot of statistics, we show the reliability of these things, so there are some, um, some properties that are very uh, consistent across different scans of the same people and that. But overall, in this here, it, it's more the idea that we can approach these dynamics using the theory of dynamical systems. And then we took, for example, an open source data set of schizophrenia, applied the same, the same approach. And what we found is that people with schizophrenia spend less time in this global mode and have more erratic excursions to these different networks specifically to the visual and to a dorsal attention network. So there was some, some uh, and to the limbic as well, so somatomotor and to the limbic. So there is some change in this spontaneous dynamics, so even without any particular task that we can find with using these type of measures. We also took a data set of people with major depressive disorder and tried to, to find what was the, the, the differences. And we found, for example, that people RRMDD means uh, uh, they are remit, they are in remission from major dep depressive disorder and compared to control. So people who are at risk of developing again MDD, because usually the people who are in remission, people who have showed uh, much lower, so it's, it's quite weak, the, it's, it changes from 4% of the time to 8% of the time, but it was highly significant of activating this pattern, right? this pattern that involved uh, I don't know, the part of interpretation of the areas, but frontal, the amens, salient, and subcortical areas, whatever. Uh, but this appeared significantly less in people with, uh, in remission from MDD. And in the controls, when we were in that network, that is there, there was more probability of switching to this prefrontal striatum network. So that there's something not only in the relative occupancy, but also in the transition probabilities that may have some functional relevance to understand brain function. But this starts accumulating when you start to, you know, uh, understanding the relevance of this, when you start replicating some findings across studies and seeing these, these changes. So this was a data set with um, an experiment on psilocybin, which is now very popular. It's this active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And the thing with this data set is that the, the subjects were scanned were inside the scanner, laying down, and then they were infused with psilocybin during the scanners. First there was a session of like eight minutes, spontaneous state, then they inject psilocybin. And then two weeks later, they go again, and they do the same with the placebo. They didn't know if the first session was the placebo, so it could be randomized order. But the cool thing that we found applying this method is that for m some of the networks, as you say here, the, the here is called PL state, this phase locking state, but it's the functional mode, whatever. Some of the networks didn't show any change in probability across the four sessions. But there was one specific mode that was this lateral frontoparietal network that showed really a signif highly significant decrease only after the infusion of psilocybin. So we could not see anymore, if you see the videos of this subject, 
uh, there was an, a pattern of activity where the lateral front parietal cortex activates and the, the other goes down. It was really down like to 3%. It was there 10 to percent of the time before psilocybin and also in the placebo condition, but not there. And with the decrease of this, just the baseline uh, or the global mode uh, increased in, in probability. So again, it aligns with this idea that there is this baseline activity mode and then you just spontaneously switch to these other networks. And what was cool with this study is that recently, like in 2023, I think October or something, there was a totally independent study from Denmark who also had a data set on psilocybin. They also applied the LIDA algorithm and they found as well that it was this lateral frontal parietal network that decreased and this decreased occurrence correlated with the concentration of, psil of plasma psilocybin. So in a way, there is something in the, in the plasma already, you know, that correlates with the activation of these functional networks that may have a link with cognition. And here, just to give a brief example of other things, like the, using mu music versus no music, we found that the most difference uh, was in a specific network only of, uh, with activity in the orbital frontal cortex. This same network was activated with deep brain stimulation, so those bars are deep brain stimulation off, deep brain stimulation on, and then control, so you see that the, the probability of detection of this activity, so when we would see the video, we would see the signals here going red and the rest going down, it in, doubles the, the occupancy with the brain simulation, so suggesting in the subthalamic nucleus that exciting the subthalamic nucleus activates the, these patterns, but even without stimulation and just seeing happy babies in the scanner, so we found that this network correlated with the happiness score of the kids that were presented in pictures inside the scanner. So there's, there's something there that is uh, intriguing, deserves further exploration. I, so there are other studies using other methodologies as well, showing evidence that these functional networks may have a function, but we are still in a very, so the results seem to show something, the statistics are there, you know, but it's still not, we don't still fully understand. Uh, but overall, have you, uh, resuming like the different studies I've been doing with this method over the last uh, seven years already, is that we're finding there are some reference values, so the DMN on average appears between 15 to 20 percent of the time in the scans uh, spontaneously. They are quite reliable, so the same subject in one scan and then two weeks apart can have the same probability of occurrence. Uh, we can detect altered values in different types of psychopathologies in that sense, so major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, autism, cognitive decline, and that can be considered a neuropsychopathology, but also auditory hallucinations we published last year. We have another one now in preparation with OCD. Even related with self-reflectiveness, so the occurrence of the default mode network correlates with the score of self-reflectiveness of a person. So does it relate really to personality, right? Or when people are suffering from a relationship breakup, we also found significant alterations. But then also it's important so not only to detect differences, but to find how could we possibly change or uh, you know act on these differences to develop some uh, therapeutic strategies. So that's the thing with these psychoactive compounds, such as psilocybin and DMT, it's more like psychedelics, but maybe also trying to understand how psychiatric medication affects this occurrence of these networks, because that's the, 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 the mechanism, the understanding that is needed to really understand how to tackle these problems. So there are some work also trying to understand, so to model how perturbation in the brain could lead to alterations in the relative occupancy of these different networks uh, is also important. It's ongoing work in the group of Gustavo as well. Uh, they call, they call the, this distribution of occupancy the probability metastable subspace, uh, that is like how the different, what is the, in a dynamical system, the more different states you have, the um, uh, the, more, the more entropy of the system, or you can be in a single one, so there are these, these mechanistic things. And also natural stimuli, we're finding music, smiling babies, so something is affecting this. What, and then for me now, the main focus has been lately to try to understand what, 
what are these functional modes coming from, right? So when we look at these patterns, typically, and here again, we see the signals, and the signals seem to co vary or correlate over time, and the idea or the interpretation or the traditional, uh, let's say, scenario is that these are co simultaneous co-activations of uh, mnemodynamic response function, right? You know about it if you know MRI. And the, the, the understanding is that there will be a, a structural network connecting these areas, so there will be a propagation across the structural network. And this happens so fast because it's in the time scales of neurons, right? Neuronal activity that we wouldn't see it with the resolution of fMRI, but you would see this co-activation simultaneously. But then one thing that is usually neglected, but now people are looking more and more at it, is that there are points in this space. So this space is not just characterized this mode by the co-activation of these areas, but also by the deactivation of the others. So there's this negative bold response when it increases in other areas. And this this network propagation hypothesis doesn't really address because long-range inhibition does not occur at this scale. So what we're finding is that indeed these fMRI signals in some areas they co-activate together, but then there are others, so you have the simultaneous co-activations and co-deactivations. Right? And this links a bit to this idea that it relates, or people have been proposing, as you know, that there is some property of resonance happening in this continuous medium. So just to say these are two distinct mechanistic scenarios for the same type of observation. So I'm trying to propose this. And this uh, uh, resonant mode that okay, I will show that has been here proposed now with, the, with the, the work by Alex Ornito shows this, I don't know if you, saw, you heard this about these modes, but what I want here to explain what is this. So what, what are resonant modes or eigen modes or harmonic modes or stationary standing waves or modes of vibration? All these things result from the universal principle of resonance in a bounded system. And that's why I want just to make a small cartoon here or illustration to explain that this can be observed across different types of structures and modalities. So you can see in a, just in a string and you always have fundamental modes. So the first mode, everything goes in phase, you see, but then the same system can be activated in a, another mode where half of the system goes up, half of the system goes down, right? So it creates a, a, a gradient, it creates a dipole, but then it can be excited to higher levels of uh, to different modes, same structure. Uh, and this can be, uh, can occur in a string, in a, in a membrane, in a 3D structure here with elastic boundaries, so they would, uh, uh, take different shapes. This is, there are really nice works even showing just a water drop levitating and being perturbed with different frequencies. And you see that it can be engaged in these different uh, modes. But well, the brain doesn't change its shape like this, right? We can consider uh, that the, the boundaries are more solid, even if they may oscillate. But one thing that happens even in structures that have solid walls, like in a room like this, you know, uh, the, there could be modes of vibration, so sound waves, these are room modes in a way, this illustration of what is a room mode, that even if you play a sound, the particles in the air here can vibrate and generate this type of patterns depending on the different frequencies that are occurring. And these type of things can, can coexist in the same space, so that's why we can hear different sounds. But the point here that I want to make is that even this par particle displacement, so imagine we could capture one voxel here that is in one antinode, and then we put another voxel there and another voxel there. So these voxels would have correlated activity, right? Because you could be sensitive to um, the density of particles in each uh, voxel, and then other voxels may be anti-correlated with this. And for this, you don't need wires between distant parts of the, of the system. You just need this propagation across the, the medium. Now, another thing with the wave theory that is different from network theory is that the nodes in a wave, it's a different concept from the nodes in a network. The nodes in a standing wave are the points that do not move in time. So in a given mode, so you always have the fixed boundaries here, for example, but then in the middle you may have this these nodes, which is where usually the, 
in the typical experiments to illustrate this, uh, they have these plates that they put sand and then they make it just vibrate and where the sand accumulates are in these nodes, is in these points of no motion. Then you have the points of high motion, so where you don't see the, the sand accumulating, but actually the system is really vibrating a lot and usually it vibrates with different, so these are called anti-nodes and they co-vary in anti-phase with their neighbors. So anti-nodes with same polarity are correlated. So this is the key uh, thing to explain how resonance in a continuous medium can drive long-range correlations and anti-correlations. So this is, um, just to say that, so this idea is not new. Here I put just an illustration for EEG, MEG, but this has been going on since the 70s to pro the, this proposal that eigenmodes uh, can explain what we actually the, the, the wave patterns we see with EG in the brain may be related to this uh, propagation. So it relates to these ideas of neural field theories that the signal is propagating through the, the field itself through a continuum. There have been, uh, so Selena Tassoy used the connectome structure and applied the thing called the graph Laplacian to, to predict what would be the modes uh, of activity of the, the network to, ex to propose that this may be the origin of what we see in, uh, in real data, in empirical data, so what has so far. And then recently the group of Alex Fornito here at Monash University, instead of using the connectome uh, eigenmodes, they use the surface mesh eigenmodes and actually compared between this and this and found that the surface mesh eigenmodes were better predictors of what you actually get from the real data. And this is what, uh, here is a point that sometimes is not very clear in, uh, in the understanding of why this, these works um, are both uh, needed. So on one side, to determine, like if you have a, a, a system and you want to understand what would be the modes of resonance there, you can analytically try to predict using, mathema using mathematical tools called the Laplace eigenfunctions or eigenvectors to predict what would be the modes of resonance of that system, right? So this would be one of them, of course, there could be more. So, but this then needs to match what we are seeing empirically. So if you just video record this, like what we do in fMRI, we are recording the activity so one thing is to predict through the structure what would be the, the modes. The other is to record the activity, get the eigenvectors of covariance. This time you don't need to do the Laplacian and see if one fits the other. That's what also they did in the, in the paper from Alex Bonito to see what. So I will now show what I've been doing. So I've been trying to detect these modes empirically, right? Not to predict them analytically. But the thing is that to confirm if what we are seeing is really, uh, are really uh, eigenmodes or eigenvectors, we need to see if they oscillate the time. And this is a critical thing that uh, uh, is a signature of resonance. So whenever we detect sustained periodicities or oscillations in a system, it is a signature that something is, is oscillating. But the problem is that fMRI signals are very, a very poor temporal resolution. So sometimes we can't go that far. So I collaborated with this uh, uh, um, Professor Dr. Noam Shamesh from Israel who's working in Portugal at the Champali Mo Center for the Unknown and he has a good 9.4 Tesla scan for rats uh, scans and they have been showing, like there was this good paper in last year in Nature Neuroscience showing that we can really detect functional networks also in rats. So, they are consistent, they do the consortium with 30 different labs, a bit like we do with the Human Connectome Project and that. Let me show you that. We detect them, they're consistent, and they also have this red and blue pattern. You see, like whenever it activates in some places, it deactivates in others. But again, this is slow. So I asked him, how fast can we go, really? How fast? So we went into the scanner room, you turn off the alarms, you know, like because this. Uh, animal scanners are different from the humans that really blocked the sequences that are approved. And so you can really play around. It was, you know, controlling the temperature and we reached the 38 milliseconds time resolution, which is unprecedented for fMRI because we focused on a single slice of the rat brain. And one thing that is uh, for the people who 
understand. Usually in the, in the fMRI scanner, when we do volumes, we, we acquire one slice at a time. So it does like right? And you do like 100 slices in each TR. And here the idea is, okay, let's not change slice. Let's try to keep always the same slice and see how fast we, we can go and if we detect meaningful signals. Because we actually had scans at 24 milliseconds, but you look at them and they're just noise, full of artifacts. But this one I will show you showed really nice um, a thing. So we focus on a slice of the rat that is known to reveal dysfunctional networks. And we tried like three different conditions. So first they are just sedated with meditomidine, which is a sedative, because the rats, you cannot just tell them to rest, right? You cannot, uh, well, there are some scans on awake rats, but actually it induces them stress. And here they are really relaxed. And then we added, we did two 10 minute scans, but in each 10 minute scan, we have 16,000 frames. It's really a lot of time point. We add a bit of isoflurane, we wait a bit, scan again, add more isoflurane, wait a bit, scan again. And then we also did two post-mortem scans just to have some validation. Here I think maybe this is going too technical, but this is just to make a point that with these ultra-fast acquisitions, our uniqueness frequency goes up to 13 hertz. So we could in theory detect things that are going up to 13 hertz. But if we look at the power spectrum up to 13 hertz, these are all the voxels. We see some, some voxels have activity, uh, for example, here, some voxels have activity there. You see those yellow peaks mean that some of the voxels have a peak. If we look in the slice, where are the voxels that show the peak 5 hertz? They are more in the arteries and veins and not in the cortex. And here we show there's a peak at 5.3 hertz. And there are some yellow blobs there. There are two times the heartbeat at 10.6. This one, this straight line, like all the voxels have power at 7.6. It's scanner noise because it also appeared in the post-mortem animal, right? There's the breathing frequency. So some voxels are activating here, two times the breathing. So it's an harmonic. So just to say everything from 0 0.5 hertz to 13 didn't seem to be uh, cortical activity related or whatever, but there was always more power here in this uh, low free, ultra slow frequency range. So if we now expand this 0 0.5 into these different beams here, so these ones we see nothing, right? But here you see there's a lot of power in these frequencies inside the cortex at 0 0.2, 0 0.25. Here at very low frequencies, there's even power beyond cortex alone. But well, we could make some mass and things. But we took, for example, this frequency range. What is going on here, right? When I did first this analysis, wanted to do, let's do a video. Let's filter the signals in this range and see what we see. And when you do this, and putting all the voxels that don't have power in this frequency um, in uh, that's transparent, so only the ones that have power in this frequency. And we see that within the cortical boundaries, and it's important to see that the cortex in the brain of the rat corresponds just to like, in terms of size, it's like a sulcus in our own cortex, right? So, so these things here may be happening through the cortical layer, but there's a propagation of, so we see clearly these, these waves, these, uh, these oscillations that are there, that are intriguing, that exhibit functional connectivity. So you see two distant areas can be highly correlated. So we could, if we would make a measure of, of uh, correlation, for example, you would see functional connectivity between these and although they're doing nothing and they're just sedated. So this is a bit of statistics, but very briefly, the top row there is the cross frequencies in the sedation condition. So there's power, as you see there, there are this red in the cortex, there's power is 0.2 hertz. When you add a bit of anesthesia, you lose a bit of power, but there's still power in the cortex. With deep anesthesia, you lose most of the power everywhere. And then this is the post-mortem, right? It's just noise. And this is strongly significant, whatever. So we take this, this range was the one that best distinguished the three conditions, OK? And I'm going now to show how consistent this is across animals. Like, so this is a broader band than before. So it's a bit more noisy. But you see that there are these patterns that are uh, this structured uh, activi activity in the cortex. If we add a bit of anesthesia, 
the patterns are less, are more global. You see the whole cortex turns red and the whole cortex becomes blue, but it's, you still distinguish some structures. And then with deep anesthesia, it's really noisy, right? I adapt the, the scale to the magnitude of the signal. So, okay, anesthesia could reduce the bulk, but it also destroys the spatial organization. So we cannot see the cortex anymore or distinguish it from the striatum or the, if you would see the dead animal scans, they are very similar, except that here sometimes we can see like it, it's all more negative or all more positive, but it's, it's very, very noisy. So if we take a principal components, let's say, of activity, I won't go in very, very deep detail here because also not for the sake of time, but the thing is if we take the principal components in the sedated condition, um, we can look at them and they are really, they show, they are really similar to what people have been describing as resting state networks, of course, in the brain. There are some that are in the cortex, some that are in the striatum, like the fourth, fourth uh, uh, um, row. And here I illustrate both of them, so the positive and negative representation of each mode. So you see I put those arrows to show that they are oscillating between positive and negative representations because when you take the time series associated to each node, we find that this principal component oscillates in time. So this is what I mean, the oscillating time, is if you take that pattern of psi 2 and then multiply it by its own temporal signature, you see that it's switching between positive and negative representations. And this will make, will generate long-range functional connectivity uh, between these different, different areas. So yeah, so this is uh, what we really see, how to try to explain, you know, this is the recorded signals, broadband here at 0 0.5 hertz. The 10 modes, individual modes that just oscillate, so they are spatially fixed, but they just oscillate in time. If you sum these together, so you take each of these small animations and add them up, it's a sum function there of these 10 modes, you see that you recover this, uh, most of this spatial organization, the things that we have traveling waves in different directions. There seem to be very complex patterns of dynamic functional connectivity, but that can be explained by a very reduced basis of oscillatory modes. So the, and then this is to show that this, is, this propagates across the cortex. So I was just showing one slice, but if we do multi-slice acquisitions, we see that the, the, these things propagate across the, the cortical sheet, let's say. So there is something interesting there. And then if we add as a fluoron, the number of modes decreases and they oscillate less, but still the first and the second are still quite strong, but then the others become a bit more noisy and they're more, more it, it's, there's less consistency also over, across groups. And with deep anesthesia, only one mode survives. So this is like, like also one of the, the key uh, things is that reduced levels of consciousness people have reported in deep anesthesia, in coma, in, um, in uh, disorders of consciousness, that there seems to be just global functional connectivity. Everything is more correlated, the signals. But it's also not that everything is, all the neurons are firing, but there's something there, but it's not periodic, it's, there's no anticorrelations. So this relates to that, this fundamental mode of activity being there. Well, these are just measures that you can use them to compare the resonance across systems. But the idea is that in meditomidine, these modes resonate longer, right? So as if you have more notes that you play with during, during sedation and with isofluorine, they are like overdamped and the, the, it's like the system changes its properties and it doesn't resonate anymore. And then this is, I'm, I'm more from computational neuroscience, so the idea is, can we, forget like this dogma of coupled neurons trying to generate this uh, the activity that we see at the macro scale and just consider that we have these waves like the nodes or the membranes of uh, you know a drum and assume that brain activity as a whole can be reconstructed just by you know playing these different uh, these different nodes so we simulate what would be a fake activity and we show that it reproduces long range functional connectivity like just a long range correlation, seed based correlation activity. But yeah, so just to sum up, I'm now at 15 minutes. Uh, I would like to, so the, 
the whole story of this work that I've been doing and trying to put everything into perspective is that I've been seeing these patterns appearing in humans and now trying to go and take animal models who are actually not doing anything, they're just in the spontaneous state and they still reveal these, these patterns of activity. So it, it, we think that indeed this, this could represent intrinsic basis functions, we don't know, that maybe during rest they're just being spontaneously activated by noise. They're part of this, it's, it's as if you, some people say, it's as if you throw a pi piano down the stairs or as if you just let a musical instrument be played by the wind. Um, it may still play sounds, but they are not integrating any type of consciousness but, or cognition or behavior, but that it may be, so what we're seeing in the resting state may be a signature of this. Well, uh, okay. So overall, I think it's very important to understand what is the origin of these intrinsic brain modes, okay? Uh, because maybe this will help us tackle the missing link between structure, brain activity, and brain function. Sometimes brain activity is confused with brain function, and here I'm in this thing that yeah, if we see this type of activity patterns, even if there's no function associated with it, so it's important to tackle this, these three things separately. Uh, and so these results, how they link with the work by Fornito and that is that this, they provide evidence, empirical evidence, supporting the hypothesis that intrinsic functional networks are associated with this standing waves uh, associated with the universal principle of resonance. <coughs> but then how these modes are traced together is still unclear. And well, I just want also to call that, uh, to make an announcement that I'm co-organizing the conference on brain modes in Bilbao 2024, and it will be really from physics to function, you know, like focusing on what is the origin of these modes and uh, acknowledge well, my, my lab in University of Minho, which is more with psychiatrists, and uh, so I'm a bit independent uh, investigator in that lab uh, where we discuss a lot about the function of these, these, these modes, and the Chemischlaf in Lisbon, which is the MRI technical guys, right, so no psychiatrists, biomedical engineers, and I find myself a bit there in the middle, and thank you all for listening. <laughs> Thank you. I've got so many questions. I'll ask the first one okay. while the students warm up. So we'll have the students ask the questions first, and then we'll, we'll go down. Oh, okay, I don't need to warm up. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm talking to you, if you're going to ask questions. It's okay, you, oh, you, you do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, firstly, thank you for the wonderful presentation. It was a lot to solve in 45 minutes. Uh, but I was wondering, um, do you have any sort of uh, mechanistic sort of, uh, is there some mechanistic in intuition into how these, because these modes are stationary, how uh, do they give rise to, to very specific traveling waves that are, and, and different traveling waves, uh, associated with different cognitive functions, so how uh, could that sort of come about, these traveling <coughs> waves from the cognitive interplay of these stationary modes? That's a very interesting question, and indeed, um, uh, a challenge to try to find this relationship because usually people understand that standing waves are the origin. So if you see some videos of uh, traveling waves that go in opposite direction, right, with the same frequency, and they will eventually generate this uh, constructive interference. And then that becomes a... Yeah, and that becomes a standing wave. But indeed, I believe that then when we superpose different standing waves, it generates traveling waves. So there is a two-way, I don't know if the, when you see a traveling wave in, empirically in the data, if it's the result of different standing waves that are still generating that, or if indeed there are always these traveling waves everywhere, but then when we compute the statistics, what we really see in the end that sums up across all the subject, what, what uh, survives, let's say, are the, the resonant modes or the ones that suffer this constructive interference. But yeah, it's important to understand that better. But uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. In terms of intuition, maybe flow of, um, of uh, I don't know, of particles, of things, but yeah, I don't know. The arousal system, there are things that may be playing a role. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah. Thanks, that was great. Uh, I was wondering with the rodent work, you know, because rodents with repeated stress or like being in the magnet will habituate the particular issue food or water or water. And so there are ways of getting rats chronically in magnets that aren't sedated at all. Have, have you attempted that? Because it'd be fascinating to take one step back and have an awake rat and, and see what's going. And then obviously you can have sensory stimuli and so on overlay. Indeed, in rodent fMRI, there's a lot of issue of how the different uh, sedation or anesthesia um, compounds affect the, the activity. And there are attempts to uh, find them uh, awake. There are now papers showing that even in the awake condition, there are several ones, I would say, recently, trying to train the animals, so the animals are trained to be there for several times, to avoid too much stress, and they find the same networks. One thing that is consistently reported is that with methotomidine, the oscillation, so you, you find this peak in the power spectrum that is usually at 0 0.1 in the awake rats, like in humans. With methotomidine, it shifts to 0 0.2. So the networks especially are similar, but then for some reason, so methotomidine, it's like would be I would say a, a, a compound that alters maybe the, the resonant frequency of these modes and make them oscillate. So it's an artificial condition, I agree. During wakefulness, not only the peak frequency changes, but they are more what is called critically damped. That is, a mode activates and then deactivates again. It's not this consistent repetition, right? But if they are spatially analogous, it should be Everything should be signatures of the same phenomenon, just with different properties. But indeed, the awake condition is now uh, becoming more and more important. Philip? Little speculative, but we're among friends here. Um, yeah. So you stressed the importance of waves as the principal component of brain dynamics. Would it be correct in inferring then that the right sort of computational formalism to understand Treating the equation and the right sort of representation between that quantum probability. Uh, a lot of work has been done in this field by lots of people, including myself, uh, using diffusion of equations, and there is uh, a well developed theory of linking the brain behaviors with diffusion theory uh, and the diffusion equation. But there is an alternative view of my colleagues around the loose side. that these wave superposition, like when I sum all the modes, obey the general form of the Schrodinger equation. And, and I even put in the abstract that it's aligned with ideas of the quantum superposition principle of waves and this. And, and people always come to temper my claims and not to infer too far and not to go beyond. But uh, I would love to indeed. I, I, think, so I think the answer is yes. Yes. Yeah. And because it, it yes. does mean that there is a, a quite interesting connection between the ideas that you're developing here and the kind of quantum probability. Mm, exactly, in, and in, in, in the Schrodinger like equation, that. there is one particular yep. condition where you do separate so space and time, right? You yep. can have yep. spatially defined modes, yep. and what is dependent is the, the time these modes are, yep. are vibrating, indeed. It, yep. it, it makes me die in the uh, think, even if yeah, the Schrodinger would really explain everything. Inside our brain, we have our own mini system that is obeying to those, to those, to those rules. But then how these rules then interact with the neural activity underneath or how it relates with computation. Yeah. Well, the interesting the question is that it gives you a story to link to, to link brain yeah. stuff to probabilities which mm -hmm. is how we describe behavior yeah. you know, in probabilistic terms. So at least you know, as a formalism, it's got the right sort of properties to describe waves in the brain and probabilities of behavior. Yes, yes, yes. And that's that's probably that's what it we're, we're approaching this missing link, like this this 
that is empirical evidence supporting those uh, those hypo theoretical hypotheses. Yes, great minds thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, yes. I would. Ex I thought I did a lot of and trying to understand. The, so, in terms of peak frequency, it's similar. One thing I notice is the ones that are cortical, like you see, one, two, three, are all cortical modes, and they all have the same peak frequency there at zero point two. But then the striatum, the mode number four, and here eight and nine seem to be harmonics of the striatum. They seem to peak at lower frequency. So, but, but there wasn't one frequency for each mode. I, I didn't find that. I don't know if it's. Uh, uh, but also, usually in a system, the harmonics all resonate at the fundamental <coughs> frequency. So, if uh, all. Repeat, I don't know. Uh, yeah. But there, there should be a second peak maybe that we should detect on the harmonics where you should see the double of the frequency. But I didn't see that. And if I can just echo that the question, but the. The mode you're so observing now, is there any logic to that? I mean, are they regions that are actually connected structurally, or are you able to infer anything, or it's not yet? This was just a single slice. I think one thing I learned is that this, you know, when people look at the, try to do parcellation, like functionally based parcellation. So imagine if you had mode number two, like there, you put okay, there's there's a border there, but then once mode number three activates the, the anatomic, the, the boundaries or the nodes, of the points of no motion or the boundaries in different modes are placed differently. So this thing of defining like anatomically defined structures, if you look at the corner, it's a continuous medium. It's like if you have a tube, you, you can put it in different modes and generate correlated activity, but it's not as if this is a completely independent uh, structure that is just coupled with a wire to another one. They're all part of, I don't know if I, but it's the insight I'm getting, but I'm not sure if. <laughs> Thank you. I was interested in the, the occupancy and mm -hmm. how quickly uh, the brain shifts from different states naturally and when perturbed. And uh, you were showing some data with the smiling babies. I am in we thought, oh, I would like to uh, give pain to people and see what to do. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, basically, I'm interested in, how, uh, does the brain get used to this new state, or does it switch back to some norm, you know, so, so, so the uh, growth of space again. So what is the yeah. temporal, uh, or is it task specific? Is it something intrinsic about uh, changing in response to task, but then set it again? Yeah, so the, yeah. So the data with the, the, the smiling babies was really very a challenging one. Uh, that I had uh, with a student in Oxford, uh, Eloise, and she had this data set where there were like 60 different women who were scanned inside the scanner, but they were previously trained to learn the temperament of children. And then each one was presented with 120 pictures of these children in neutral condition. And the idea was to see if we could detect anything in brain activity that could relate with the learned infant temperament. With the temperament of two. But they did it, so the so that data was analyzed by several people until it came to me. So sometimes I often have this, it's like Rana, we we are not finding anything, can you can we find something? And it it seemed to work, but it was so the thing was that the pictures were presented every every time they pressed the button to score, a new picture was presented. And sometimes it was so fast that it was like two, three seconds a difference between each picture. Mm -hmm. So what we did was to take what was the pattern, the average pattern, presented like two TRs uh, after, the, or active two TRs after the, each picture, two time points, right? After each picture. That's when we did the statistics and this pattern came out. And we sh so it's a very instantaneous thing in a task, this to see that being sensitive to the, to the difference in temperament and it really revealed, so the thing is, it, it was so strange because it was the only, and it was consistent across K, so that the areas there, we, we don't, but if we would see the, um, the names of the areas, there is the, um, the, it was the orbitofrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate, but then also, oh no, the insula, sorry, the big bar there is the insula, and then below is parahippocampus and, and amygdala, and hippocampus. So it's related with memory 
amygdala, insula, and orbitofrontal cortex. So there was this, we were like processing something. It, it was strange. Like I wouldn't expect, I, I, it was curious that it